Well, good morning and welcome to worship here at Bethlehem. We're called to praise the Lord at all times, in all things, and in all places. So I invite you to stand with us this morning as we look to focus our attention on Jesus, Savior, Healer, and Redeemer. you because every praise is due to you all things are from you and through you and to you and for you and so we are profound recipients of your massive goodness and grace and kindness and mercy and so we praise you and we give you thanks for who you are and how you have so lavishly and graciously uh, treated us especially for your great mercy to us in Christ Jesus. And so I pray that you would gather us in this morning to worship you and praise you as praise is fitting and due to you. And then I also pray that you would fill us with hope. Whatever situation we're in, 
every good comes from you. And so I pray that in all the situations of life represented in, in each of these people here, you would fill us with hope in you. That you will be good to us. You will be gracious to us. You will give us all that we need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So, so let none here leave discouraged. But rather, fix our hope on you, I pray, as we worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome to worship this morning. Uh, the God of hope, and uh, I'll, I'll add, not add more that I just did. I just, just pray that uh, whether you're a, a long-time Bethlehemer or whether you're, you're a first-time attender, that... that uh, that you would hope in God this morning and God would meet you where you are and, and, and fill you with his spirit and his promises and his joy and that there would be no discouragement left in you but rather hope in him for today and hope for tomorrow. If you're a guest, we have a, a visitor card at the welcome desk that you can fill out just a little bit of information about yourself, and then you can request uh, different information about the church or how to get connected. And so take advantage of that, please, if you're, if you're a guest and you want to move into this church family, which I would hope that you would. We want to express our condolences to Bob Nelson, whose wife Nancy passed away yesterday. Uh, they're longtime members here at Bethlehem, and the funeral details are, are pending. So, those will be the details will be posted on the on the website. Preaching this morning is is Ken Curry, longtime pastor here, longtime elder, now working with our college ministry through campus outreach. I'm very glad that Ken will be opening up to us. Uh, the Sermon on the Plain, uh, it's like Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. A lot of the content that Jesus spoke on the Mount in Matthew 5 is, is there in Luke 6. So thank you, Ken, for preaching this morning. Last Friday, this room was filled for the commencement services for Bethlehem College and Seminary. And I just want you to know that there were 78 graduates who walked across here and got their diplomas. And uh, five of those graduates from last Friday night were actually on the screen. Uh, a, a little video clip from the graduation uh, ceremonies in Cameroon. So five Masters of Divinity students graduated in uh, the BCS Extension site in Cameroon, which was great. So 78 students, we want to pray God's blessing on them, and we're thankful for the partnership that we have with the, with the school here downtown. Uh, Emily is our global partner of the week. She works in church planting and in business in North America. There she is. Excuse me, North Africa. I had North America on my note. North Africa? That, I thought, what's she doing? In? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> She's working at Target. No, that's not right. Uh, <laughs> makes more sense. Uh, North Africa, I want to pray for Emily. And then our unengaged people group of the week are the Nuristani people of Afghanistan. We've prayed for these people before. They're predominantly Sunni Muslim. And just a, a note, the word nur means light. And so let's pray that Christ would bring them out of darkness into his marvelous light. We pray. Father in heaven, thanks so much for your light, the light of Christ. And I pray for this Nuristani people of Afghanistan and pray that, um, that you would call them out of darkness into your marvelous light by the power of the gospel. And so please send your word to them, send messengers, laborers, and then I pray for the fruit of the gospel to be born in them. I pray that churches would be planted, believers would be gathered, and your word would continue to spread among the Nuristani and beyond to the whole country of Afghanistan. And then I pray for Emily working in North Africa. Uh, and uh, I pray for your advance of the gospel there as well among the peoples. Meet us now in worship, and again, I pray that 
None of us would leave without a sense of hope in Christ. It's ours, ours by the promise of the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. the words of Psalm 42.
As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my whole being for you, O God. My whole being thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my being, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you bent down, O oh my being? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God, my being is bent within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan to the Hermans, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waters. All your breakers and your waves have surged over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me all the day long while they say to me, where is your God? Why are you bent down, O oh my being? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. This is the word of the Lord.
King of glory, eternal King of the ages. We praise you this morning that you are, in fact, a holy God, a place of safety, a refuge. We praise you this morning because your power is great and there is no one greater. Your kingdom is the everlasting kingdom. And we come this morning to that group of people you've called out of darkness. We gather in the name of Jesus as your church, as your family. And many of us feel our weaknesses. So we come. We come and bow down. We come to gather in, as it were, to the refuge, to the fortress, to the tower. The Spirit is here. Oh God, we need you. Oh, we need you. Forgive us for the sins we have committed in word or deed. Forgive our poor attitudes expressed, harsh words spoken, and the unintended impact on others of our actions. Forgive us this morning for personal pride, for clinging to self-sufficiency and not trusting in the all-sufficiency of Christ. Forgive us for not valuing or helping others who are created in the image of God. So we're fighting for joy this morning. So we, as it were, bow before you. Strikes me that there are some here that are just rejoicing, coming off commencement. And we praise you for that joy. And we are very aware that those here that have lost spouse come in heavy, weary, needing the refuge, the rock. So in the quietness of this moment, would you we invite you to lift up your prayers in silence to the Lord. He is here. He will meet you. Invite you to stand or sit or kneel, but look to the Lord right now. is compassionate and gracious slow to anger abounding in love he will not always accuse nor will he harbor his anger forever and he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities for as high as the heavens are above the earth so great is his love for those who fear him as far as the east is from the west so far has he removed our transgression from us. So based upon the assurance of the word of God this morning, know 
as you confess your sins, they are forgiven. Amen.
Father God, we praise you and thank you for the hope that we have in Christ, that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. You have taken us out of our sin and out from under your wrath and your judgment and have clothed us with the righteousness of Christ and wrapped us in your loving kindness, your steadfast love, your, your hesed is the Hebrew word, your gospel love, and have wrapped us in such a manner that you will continue your steadfast love to us forever and ever and ever and ever. So we give thanks to you because your steadfast love to us in Christ endures forever. So bless this offering we're about to receive now, the giving of our tithes and our offerings to the glory of your name, to the glory of Christ, for the advancement of the gospel. Even as we give you our tithes, we, we give you our, ourselves, our whole selves, body, soul, and spirit that we might be to the praise of your glorious grace. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, each week in the service, we, we pause at this time to, to, uh, to give our tithes and offerings, or you might not be giving right now, but to remind us that part of the worship of God, part of worshiping God with our whole being, is the giving of our tithes and offerings. And, and on the screen, there's different ways to give. You can give right in the moment by texting or through the app. You can give with an offering. Some people prefer to come to church and, and put their offering in the box in the back each week. Personally, I, I really know, I, I was going to say I think, I know our giving has increased in generosity and consistency by online giving. I mean, it just has, and, and I say that to maybe underscore that because it's super helpful for the church, especially through the summer. If you're a regular, if you're a member here and you want to give to the church, it just, I'll speak for myself, it, <laughs> it smoothed out our giving through the summer so it didn't have these gaps in it when we were on vacation and stuff like this. So anyway, just a plug for the regularity, and honestly, online giving helped us to be more generous. And consistent. So two, two, two things that I have benefited from by the online manner. So whichever way you give, um, our prayer is that it would be an expression of your heart. You're offering yourself to Christ. Presenting your bodies to God as your spiritual worship. And the giving of tithes and offering is a piece of that. So give us the Lord leads. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing your name is life Break
Father, our joy is full as we gather this morning to worship you. With thankful and humble hearts, we come in prayer before you as your image bearers. Your son took on humanity to make us more. We worship because you trans you've transformed us. Through your son, Jesus, we are made holy and a unified spiritual family. This is no small thing. You made us spiritually alive, and this morning we are spiritually awake to you, and the overflow of that life is worship. Your word says that your son, Jesus, is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Jesus, in your incarnation, you became our brother and identified with us. And you are not ashamed to name us as called ones, your brother, your sister. So that is our identity today, our privilege, and we are filled with gratitude. Our adversary, the author of evil, Satan is a bully and does his best to bully us with fear. Fear that comes from confusion, the fear of abandonment, the fear of slander, fear of uncertainty, and the shame of sin, the fear of suffering, and the final, the fear of our final enemy, death. 
Thank you, Jesus, that because you became flesh and blood, you stepped into our world to rescue us. You stepped in to fight, into our fight to stand by us. You, as our Savior, broke the power of Satan and to free us from this author of lies, this accuser, this thief of hope and robber of joy, the bully of fear. And you promised to never leave us nor forsake us. You promised to send a comforter, the one who is called alongside, the Spirit. And we are so grateful. Today, Father, we celebrate so much of the arc of life. And part of that is we give you praise for our graduates. From all levels of education to the next. Thank you for faithful family who have supported and some who have taught their own children to make these transitions possible. We celebrate with our own Bethlehem College and Seminary graduates. May they be filled with the knowledge of your faithful empowering through these years to this day and into their futures. Thank you for your faithfulness to complete this formative life task. Father, today we pray also for our brothers and sisters. We pray for those of our congregation who are suffering with physical and mental pain and illness. For those undergoing treatment and therapy, we pray for healing and for mercy and strength that is from above. We ask for your tender comfort and care for the Eileen Westberg family who celebrated her homecoming yesterday and for Bob Nelson and his children who were there with Nancy as she passed from this life into eternal life with you as well yesterday. We pray for our widows and our widowers who are reminded of the loss of life partners and the hope of being with them one day. Father, knit us together as a congregation. Knit us together in love as we celebrate both joys of life transitions, births and weddings, accomplishments, and as we wrestle together with struggles to the victory that is promised. In all these things, we are sons and daughters because of your mercy and the gospel. Now would you speak again to us through your word as you fill our brother Ken with your spirit. We love you, Father. Open our hearts to the spiritual food we need today. In Jesus' name, amen. Our sermon text today is Luke chapter 6, verse 17 onwards. Luke chapter 6, verse 17. And he came down with them and stood on a level place. With a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. 
But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, brother. Jesus said, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So what Jesus describes is an impossibility, not an improbability (laughs) or a magic trick, but an impossibility. These are unnerving words for most of us who live in America in the 21st century. What hope can we have that God will do the impossible in us? Let's seek the Lord together. Father, miracle worker, we pray, seek you now, I seek your face now and ask for you to do miracles in this room. We go here, we go to you because where else will we go? There is no academic center, there is no hospital, there's no precious metal mine or bank vault in which we can find what we need the most for our souls that we might enter the kingdom of God. So I pray for you to do miracles in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're continuing in our our series on Luke. If you've been here, you know that's where we've been. I'm a context guy. I can't help it. And um, so please bear with me. Hopefully this will be helpful. Keep these things in mind, just a few things to understand about Luke, this gospel of Luke that we're reading as we continue on in the coming weeks. Luke is a companion of Paul. Luke wasn't one of the apostles himself, but was very close to the, the apostle Paul with him and many of the things we have in scripture as, a, as his own eyewitness. Witness. Luke is precise, he's careful, he's detailed. His Greek is superb as an educated person. It might be even a bit ironic because Luke would have likely been a person of means, not speaking from poverty, but someone who was educated. He speaks as one who is educated and probably has resources. He speaks with a burden particularly to the Gentile converts, most likely himself a Gentile convert. He has a place for this disenfranchised, a place for the poor, prominence for women. It's a a gospel of praise. There's a lot of praise in Luke's gospel. It's wonderful. In fact, often he'll say as they go along, praising God, praising God they such and such, praising God they this and so forth. It's a gospel of prayer. Prayer is very prominent in Luke's gospel. Prayer to the one who does miracles. It's a gospel for all peoples. Luke has in view all peoples, the peoples of the world, that they would know the gospel, that they would know Jesus, that this this gospel message wouldn't be a tribal message, but it's now to the ends of the earth, to all peoples. For Luke, the love of God is wide and it is deep. The wide, wide, deep, deep love of God in the gospel. That's, That's kind of where Luke's coming from. Of course, we understand that the scriptures are penned as the Holy Spirit carries the authors along. So don't get too distracted with who Luke is because though we see Luke and his personality is not set to the side, he's not a machine. At the same time, this is the Holy Spirit. We have what we have because of God's goodness to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. The context flow here 
Um, we see parallel in Luke and Matthew, a lot of parallel. So we've, we, we have um, seen and heard the preaching on Luke 4 and Matthew 4, Luke's temptation and victory over the devil. I just want you to know what's happening right before this. Then Jesus begins his public ministry. It says in Luke 4, 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee and a report about him went through all the surrounding country and he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all. In Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So Jesus, as we enter into our text today, Jesus' popularity and polarity has grown. He's, his name is known wide. And, and in fact, last week we heard from Pastor Kenny the account of Jesus calling his disciples, the particular disciples to him for the particular ministry of apostleship. Just before that, Jesus heals a man and it says that the scribes and the Pharisees, what, what would it be like for you? You, you witness the healing, the supernatural healing of someone. Some of us have, have witnessed these things. What is your response? The response of the scribes and the Pharisees is they are furious. They are furious that this man is doing this and getting this attention. So, and yet the crowds come to him. The fame, it didn't take very long. <laughs> Tempted by the devil, starts his ministry of preaching, people are healed, and man, the word has spread like wildfire. No social networking, no telephones, no texting, and everybody knows about this, and they're coming from all over the place. And that leads us to the sermon on the plain. And just in case it's the que a question you have, it's a natural question, it's a parallel account, it seems, in Matthew 5. Matthew 5's Sermon on the Mount is longer and has more detail than what we have here in Luke 6. And it, it prompts the natural question, are these the same or not? Um, it, it, I'm going to give you the, the best answer, I think, to that is it really doesn't matter. Because both sermons, whether they're the same or not, are the content of the preaching that Jesus did. And this sermon surely was longer. You know, when we get up here to preach, um, we are conscious of the time. And there's a lot of thing, little quips that people send. You know, people stop losing it. They don't pay attention after 20 minutes. Somebody will send you that. You know, 40 minutes? I mean, do we really have to, you know? I don't know. I don't know. People are different. But I will tell you this. You can read the whole of the Sermon on the Mount in about seven minutes. I think Jesus had more to say than that in that moment. <laughs> and beyond that, Jesus went everywhere preaching these things. So the Sermon on the Plain could be a, could be a different account or it could just be they were up on the mount with the disciples. They come to a flat spot on the mountain and they gather there. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. In any case, what is preached by Jesus is absolutely revolutionary. It is a turning on its head, the values of the day and of our day. I think that the, because we're familiar with these words, most of us, we, they, we, can get, we can get used to them, sensitized to them, inoculated to them. It's, it's just like, yeah, 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 the, the uh, blessed are the poor, da, 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 da. It's good for us to remember that, that what he is saying here is revolutionary. It is dramatic. We see, in fact, in fact, one has, some have, in an attempt to summarize what, what do we have here, some have said, the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, this content is the Christian manifesto. This is the expression of what the kingdom looks like, what it looks like for people to live in kingdom hope, with kingdom ethic, with kingdom values. And it turns on its head the, the values that we tend to have, the values of our culture. So let's look at specifically the text here. Jesus is addressing the crowds, or it says his disciples, but what, it is a, a question, what does that mean? Uh, is he speaking to his newly appointed apostles, or is he speaking to the crowd? Again, I don't think we have to be precise on this question. I think he's speaking to all, 
But I think that he also has, a, this is particularly for his apostles. Like he's speaking to the crowd, but his apostles are gonna c- carry this kingdom message forward. They're going, they are going to be commissioned to carry the gospel forward. They need to have an understanding of the Christian value, the Christian kingdom, the kingdom of God. How does it work? What's important? What's not important? So he's preaching to this crowd with his disciples there. I think each each lesson is particularly important for them. And of course, Jesus' notoriety has grown to the point that people all over are coming to him. Just sort of a parenthesis. I can't help this in my mind. I, 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 I sort of place myself in the context. I wonder, was there a VIP section? The crowd comes. They're kind of all getting up to Jesus, and then there's kind of a make way, make way, and here come the important people, and they get to sit. I've never been to a, a VIP, in a VIP section. I've, I've been to one concert at US Bank Stadium. It was free tickets given to my wife. We were in the second to the last row. I was so tired when I got to the top, I took a nap. My wife and I and some friends went to see a play on Hennepin Avenue a couple weeks ago. We could not see the faces of the people (laughs) in the play, which it it turns out that kind of matters if you want to really get it. (laughs) VIP section, the scribes and Pharisees maybe, are the rich people with their people fanning them and they got a little seat. Imagine that. And then Jesus says these things as the poor people, the common people, the dirty people are all scattered about. And then he says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now. And when the VIP section, what are they eating? People bringing them food. Jesus looks right past them. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil in the count of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. And then, I don't know if there was a VIP section, but I suspect there were some, some people of means. And then he addresses them, and woe to you who are rich. For you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. And woe to you when all people speak well of you, for their fathers did to the false prophets. The contrast between blessed and woe could not be more stark. We must not water it down. We we must be honest. To be blessed the way Jesus is speaking is to be loved by God, is to be saved by God, is to be embraced by God, is to be favored by God. And woe is to be cursed. Woe is to be damned. Woe is to be condemned forever. This this is not light language. This is not the red team and the blue team. This is not those who are kind of unfortunate, but those who are kind of have good things. This is as strong as it gets. So in summary, Those who are poor, hungry, weeping, and persecuted are blessed, and those who are rich, full, laughing, and admired are cursed. What are we to do with this, friends, as we sit in this nice room, in this conditioned air? I don't think anyone's going to fall over from starvation. I know I'm not. What are we to do with this? Natural questions come to mind. Who are the rich? How much money do you have to be to have to be considered rich? My guess is if we surveyed this congregation, most would say, I'm not really either. I'm not really poor, I'm not really rich. But I don't think that Jesus has a third category here. Where does that put you? What does that put me? What if I have plenty to eat? Should I fast more so I can feel more hungry? I like to laugh. I laugh a lot with my friends. Should I try to be more serious? Someone says something funny and I... <clears throat> because I want to be the blessed? Are we supposed to have... 
Aren't we supposed to have a good reputation as Christians? How do I have a good reputation and show evidence of persecution? These are natural questions. What do we do about this? First of all, what I want to be real about what the Bible says about poverty and about the poor. Let's, let's not start with our yabbats. You might think that's a Yiddish word. It's not. It's just a word and what we do to kind of provide an excuse. Well, you won the race. Yeah, but you had a head start. So we don't want to say initially, well, he, yeah, yeah, but that's not what he really means. Let's start with being honest and looking at what the Bible says of the place and the prominence of the poor in the Bible. There's over 200 Old Testament references to the poor. The poor are not a side thought. They're not an afterthought. Paul reports the apostles' confirmation to his ministry to the Gentiles and the exhortation in Galatians 2 to remember the poor. Jesus said that we will always have the poor with us. So no social plan, no redistribution of wealth, no ministry program will eradicate poverty. And still we are to engage poverty with gospel, hope, and love. Ask Jeff Noyad, one of our deacons who leads Jericho Road, if he thinks he's going to work himself out of a job. Who are the poor? Not just the poor for poor decisions. Now, now I'm going to say a couple things here. Some of you are not going to like this. It's okay. Email me is fine. Ken.curry at Bethlehem.church. Um, but I would go ahead and, and buckle up your seatbelt, your emotional seatbelt here for a minute. The poor are not just poor for poor decisions. They are, though, they're having, they're, they're described as those who have nothing or very little and are victims of injustice. Proverbs 13, 23, the fallow ground of the poor, hear this, okay, let's track with me. The fallow ground of the poor, it's like the good ground of the poor, would yield much food but it is swept away through injustice. It's not that they don't work hard. It's because of injustice that their fallow ground does not yield. Tim Keller says that the gospel works in the hearts of Christians such that we know, we love, and we become poor. The biblical response to the poor is, here's a verse, in, in Proverbs 14, 21 and 31, here's what they say. Whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Proverbs 14, 31, whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker. It doesn't say he insults the poor man, but surely he does. Whoever insults, who oppresses the poor insults his maker insults God to oppress the poor, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. Now I said the biblical response to the poor is, and I paused because that word in the SV, generous in Proverbs 14, 21 and 31 is, it's different in all the major translations. Some have it as mercy, some have it as grace, some have it as kindness, and some have it as generous. And I look at that and what, what impacts me is that God has the best word, the best of our words. What are our best words? <laughs> Grace, generosity, mercy, kindness. You know who gets those words? The poor. That's how we're to act. The Christian understands it is not just a matter of individual sin and choices but the world is broken and poverty exists because people live in a fallen world where things are not as they ought to be. And we are called to it, to know, to love, and to become poor. Now, if you had your emotional seatbelt buckled, you could probably loosen it just a little bit. Because I do want to acknowledge and talk the rest of the time about the fuller picture. Now that we've been honest about the reality of poverty and the biblical truth regarding the poor, where do we go from here? Well, in our text, there are not 
eight groups of people. There's not those who are poor and those who are rich, those who are hungry and those who are not hungry, et cetera, et cetera. There's two groups of people. There's one group who is poor and they're hungry and they're oppressed and they weep. And there's a group who are rich and they're full and they laugh and they have a good reputation. There's two groups of people and this is how they're characterized. If you are poor, obviously you are hungry. And if you are hungry, you weep. I don't know how many of us in this room have ever truly been hungry. I don't think I can say I've ever truly been hungry. But when I am hungry the way I use hungry, I'm not a a nice person to be around. So imagine you're the gnawing hunger, the emptiness and the lack of knowledge of where your meal will come from. That person weeps. And that person is not popular. They're not invited to the good parties. And if that person identifies with Jesus, they are as cast out as cast out can be. Yes, there is more to the poverty that Jesus speaks of than merely the lack of resources. Yes, Matthew's description of poor in spirit in Matthew 5 goes deeper to the ultimate issue. In fact, look at the explanation of the condemnation of the rich in verse 24. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. The issue is that they, not that they are rich, the issue is that they have received their consolation. It it is not simply that they have wealth, but that they are looking to it for their hope, joy, identity, and ultimately, yes, their salvation. Like a consolation prize. I don't, do you know what that is? You know what that is? Like some of the younger people might not have heard of that. Us folks, my generation, you know, it's, it's how you try to make people feel better for losing. And, and, and in fact, it's like worse. It's like a heaping on of the loss. You know, when my kids played a lot of sports growing up and, and it seems that from the time that they could take solid food, they wanted to win and they knew who won. So they were, we'd play in some of those leagues, you know, initially where they don't keep score. No, nah, nah, nah. you know, four years old. Dad, who won? I don't really know, son. They won't really know. I, it was 19 to three, we won. <laughs> well, it doesn't really, yes it does. There's no point in going there. A consolation prize is a prize which isn't really a prize at all. It's worse than nothing. It's a constant reminder that you didn't even win the prize. So for a rich person, the consolation, they have all of it already. William Barclay says this, if you set your heart and bend your whole energies to obtain things that, which the world values, you will get them, but that is all you will ever get. So what do we have here? I would say that this is a middle-class church. I don't mean that we don't have a few folks who have exceptional means and that we don't have some folks who might be really struggling to make ends meet, even their housing and their food. But as a whole, we're not a poor church and we're not a rich church in terms of current economic terms. Have you ever been to a, a poor church or a rich church that you would call? In India, we, we worshiped in some poor churches. We worshiped in a church where everyone sat on the floor. I think you would have laughed to see us Americans when we realized we got, we're gonna sit on the floor. We, we worshiped in another church, which was basically a storage unit, with cinder block walls. They pushed back the metal doors and then there was dirt on the floor and no air conditioning and no nothing but this cinder block room and that was church. I've been to churches where they have like water slides and Starbucks in the church. Been in one of those churches. So I don't think we're really either of those. We're kind of a middle class church, which means the greatest threat to the gospel for us is middle class religion. What is that? What do I mean by that? Middle class values, which include hard work, earning it, being respectful and polite and nice. And all these things are fine as far as they go, but they cannot save you. They cannot save you. You cannot be a Christian if you're middle class in your spirit. 
If you find your identity, your hope, your satisfaction in your bank account with its comfortable balance, you are under a curse and have received your consolation and have no inheritance in God. If you find your identity, your hope, your satisfaction in your things, your food, your hobbies, your grill, you have received your consolation and you will suffer the emptiness of hell forever. If you find your identity, your hope, your satisfaction in your friends with whom you laugh and you ignore your own plight and the plight of your friends and the plight of the world, you have received your consolation and you have no peace with God. If you find your identity in your profession, your competence, your reputation, you've received your consolation in full and will only be cast out from the love, acceptance, and affirmation of God forever. So when we look at these texts, we see that middle class religion can only condemn. If you're middle class in spirit, you might love religion but you can't be saved. Only, the only people who hear the gospel are the poor in spirit. You can't hear the gospel without being poor in spirit, without recognizing I have nothing. Religion says try hard, live nobly, give to the poor, even give to the poor. Be nice. The religious person says I can do it. The gospel says no one is good, not even one. Even my best deeds are like filthy rags before him. I shared with our young adult group when I had the privilege of their retreat this illustration. I'm going to do a version of that. Um, so I have these, I have this memory before, by God's grace, he exploded my categories of what salvation and life and joy are all about. I had this memory of thinking it like a balance scale, a cosmic balance scale. If I can just do enough good things that outweigh my bad things, then I'll go to heaven. I do good things and bad things. And I think a lot of people think that way. So I have these Legos here. Now Legos seem to have, have exploded in their popularity. I don't have any of those like $300 little mini figures, just just a few of these blocks. And let's pretend that we have a balance beam here for a moment. And on this side of the balance, balance scale, sorry, not a balance beam, that'd be dangerous. Balance scale. And on this side of the balance scale, we'll put some good deeds. So give me a good deed. Terry Wentz, give me a good deed. Uh, Feeding the poor. Feeding the poor. So I go outside and I feed the poor and I put that on my balance scale. And then I'm gonna do another good deed. So Luke Bolton, give me a good deed. Mow, your Mow my neighbor's lawn. And I'm doing well. Imagine we have a balance scale here, right? And my it's scale's tipping. But then kind of have a bad day. I'm not gonna ask for one of these. That's just too, <laughs> too risky. And I know some of you too well. So I do a, I do a bad thing. I'm, I'm harsh with my wife. And, and the scale tips this way. And, and, then, and then I'm selfish. I do a real selfish thing. And then I, but, then, but then I go and I, I read my Bible. And so now I'm doing okay. And as long as I die when I'm this way, I get to go to heaven. So every time I do one of these, I get to do one of these. But that's middle class religion. That's works. I do enough good things. I'm saved. I don't need a gospel. I don't need a savior. I just need to be more good than I'm bad. But here's the truth of the gospel. All of our good deeds, when done to satisfy God, to gain favor with him, they go on this side. That's hard to hear, isn't it? You're telling me I can go to hell for reading my Bible? If you read your Bible to say to God, look at me, look at my righteousness, Lord condemnation. Look at me. I fed the poor, Lord. Accept me. Condemnation. The gospel isn't for those who have good deeds. It's for those who are poor in spirit, 
who have nothing to put before the Lord. The one who comes to him must know that he has nothing. I have nothing. Even my good deeds condemn me. Ah, but I want your mercy. I want your grace. The one who comes to him must know he has nothing. I have nothing. The gospel works in your heart not only to know and to love the poor, but indeed to become poor. To strip away the arrogance and the haughtiness and the self-righteousness and lay yourself bare before the Holy One to say, I have nothing. To come to Jesus is to receive a value you've never known before. You got a five million dollar jet? I've got Jesus. You have a banquet? In this life, I have food that will never perish. Living water. The love and favor, inheritance of the King of Kings. The gospel is only for the spiritually poor. So all the way back to where we started, Jesus said, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. What Jesus describes is an impossibility. No amount of hard work, no amount of goodness, no amount of politeness, no amount of niceness will accomplish it. It takes a miracle. So what hope can we have that God will do the impossible for us? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Apart from the gospel of Christ, we are poor. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see our spiritual poverty. The gospel is that Jesus saves the spiritually poor by becoming poor to give us his riches. His cross is not cheap. His priceless blood cleanses and saves us to the uttermost. And it is for those who have come to the end of themselves. Woe to you if you are not in Christ and you die in your sins. But blessed are you if you are in Christ. Blessed is Tim Keller today to whom I owe a great debt for this sermon. And rich beyond words, blessed is Eileen Westberg, whose inheritance would make the pharaohs jealous. Blessed is Nancy Nelson, whose heavenly possession would make the crown jewels a cheap bauble by comparison. Blessed are the great cloud of witnesses, name upon name, that we could say in this place, not because in this life they had a lot, but because they knew that before the Holy One they had nothing and would come to him and open their arms and receive by grace salvation through Christ. Blessed are you if your riches are the riches of Christ. I asked Pastor Chuck if we could sing Jesus paid it all. You know this, 90% of you know this. Thy, he says, thy strength indeed is small. I mean, if I was gonna, I, I would not presume to correct the hymn writer, so I'll go with that. But it's not just small, it's non-existent. Child of weakness, we're not just weak, we're dead. But find in him thine all in all. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. I find in you, your power and power alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. I have nothing good whereby thy gr grace to claim. Let's pray. God, we praise you as the God of miracles. How could a camel 
go through the eye of a needle. It can't. How can we save ourselves? We can't. To be saved is to be one in whom a miracle of God has worked. Blind eyes seeing, deaf ears hearing, dead hearts beating with new life. Mouths that curse, that bless. Mouths that are cold, warm with words of blessing. Praise you, thank you Jesus, that you've paid it all, that we might know you forever. In your name, amen. to sit for this, uh, sit for just a moment for this benediction. Just a, uh, I can't, I can't get over it. I just can't 
I can't get over it. The stark, don't worry, it's not sermon number two. Just the stark, the starkness that we're, that we're, to, we're to feel in the contrast between snow and blood. And that what gets us to snow cleansed is not what we do, but this blood that covers us. And then, because the blood has covered us, we go and do. We go and do, we love the poor, not to be loved by God, but because we're loved by God. So now, may he who was rich and became poor for you be your greatest hope and joy and satisfaction because you who are poor are rich in him. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.